afternoon, good evening, and good morning. We'd like to begin as people file into the seminar room. A few introductory remarks. My name is Kearsley Stewart, and I'm a faculty member here at Duke University in the Global Health Institute and also in the Department of Cultural Anthropology. And it's my great pleasure and honor to welcome all of you to today's panel discussion of a new book by Dr. Eugene Richardson titled Epidemic Illusions on the Coloniality of Global Public Health. This was published a few months ago by MIT Press. Dr. Richardson will begin our event with some summary remarks on his book, and then he'll be followed by an esteemed panel of commentators, Dr. Paul Farmer, Dr. Agnes Binyawaho, and Professor William Sandy Darity. And then we have set aside time for audience Q&A. Let me introduce everyone in a few moments. But first I'd like to invite Darian Herndon to offer a land acknowledgement. Darian is a Duke senior majoring in biology with a double minor in chemistry and history. She's a member of the Lumbee tribe of North Carolina and an affiliate of the Tuscarora Indian Nation. She's a 2020 Udall scholar president of Duke's Native American Student Association and a founding chapter member of Alpha Phi Omega Sorority, the country's oldest Native American sorority. Darian. Wing of Paula Sakurwin Khan, Nutter Romans Darian Lumbina Noam. Hello, my name is Darian Herndon and I am a member of the Lumbee tribe and affiliated with the Tuscarora Nation. And I'll be starting this off with a land acknowledgement. A land acknowledgement is a formal statement that recognizes and respects indigenous peoples as traditional stewards of this land and the enduring relationship that exists between indigenous peoples and their traditional territories. To recognize the land is an expression of gratitude and appreciation to those whose territory on which uh, that you reside on. And a way of honoring those indigenous people who have been living and working on the land from time immoral. It is important to understand the long-standing history that has brought you to reside on the land and to seek and understand your place within that history. And this is, refers to Duke University as a physical location. So we acknowledge that this space and greater university gathers on land that has long served as the site of meeting and exchange among a number of indigenous peoples, historically the Shikori and the Catawba people. It is also important to recognize the eight tribes that currently reside in North Carolina, and these include the Kohari, the Lumbee, the Maharan, the Okanichi Band of the Saponi, the Halawa Saponi, the Wakama Suwan, the Saponi, and the Eastern Band of the Cherokee. We honor and respect these diverse indigenous peoples connected to this territory on which we gather today. Thank you. Thank you, Darian. First, a few housekeeping remarks. Your mics and videos are already muted, but you are welcome and encouraged to use the Q&A rather than the chat to post questions and comments. We have a couple people monitoring the, the Q&A. Um, we're recording the event, obviously, and we're gonna send the link to everyone who registered. Hopefully we'll have that link to you by Wednesday this week, and we want you to feel free to share that link widely. I'd like to thank our event sponsors, the Duke Global Health Institute, the Samuel Dubois Cook, uh, Cook Center on Social Equity, and the Duke Department of Cultural Anthropology. And a deep, deep thanks to both Lizzie Roy and Liz Imoni for their administrative support. Thanks, Lizzie and Liz. But before I introduce our panelists and hand over to Dr. Richardson, I'd like to take two minutes to offer some introductory thoughts. Um, in 2013, Richard Horton, the editor of The Lancet, reported on a meeting at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and posed the question, is global health neocolonialist? Well, the answer even in 2013 was yes, global health is neocolonialist. Neo and Horton suggested the only way forward was to begin anthropologically. That is with no preformed ideas about the experience of health. Um, in a recent issue of Anthropology Today, Melissa Leach, also a social anthropologist, wrote an editorial about the increasingly visible role of medical anthropologists, both local and international, in shaping global health responses to infectious disease emergencies and humanitarian crises. And Jean Richardson's book reflects deeply on the context of the 2013-2016 West African Ebola outbreak. But Melissa Leach offered a cautionary tale 
In the fields of development and global health, anthropology is often seen as a magic key that can unlock the mysteries of local cultures. Yet our community engaged research methodologies are often borrowed yet applied uncritically and without attention to the historical and structural features that shape local contexts and local behaviors during health emergencies, further entrenching the gap between global health governance systems and the local community deploying resources to halt an outbreak, for example. In the midst of all of this, however, um, Jean reminds us to pause to remember the anthropology itself since its inception has been a colonial project. And anthropologists with our tools, our research tools for knowledge production and extraction were essential to the success of the colonial expansion of Europe and the violent displacement of Native Americans in North America and elsewhere. Anthropologists were positioned as the objective scientific outsiders who measured, surveyed, interviewed and defined the local subjects for the benefit of colonial domination. As a discipline, we are aware of our odious roots and our continuing relationship to the darker side of modernity, to borrow Mignolo's term. And as a result, anthropology has been critically examining the field and ourselves since 1970s. Jean's book is a clear roadmap to how global health can learn from a pluralistic approach to creating new knowledge and acting on that new knowledge. First, he advises recognize that all the features of global health, its ideas, methods, research questions, approaches to collaboration and intervention also emanate from and continue to be enmeshed in our own historical relationship to colonialism and scientific imperialism. Jean's book helps us to first recognize and acknowledge that relationship. And then he offers ideas on how to critically and reflectively understand implications for our practices going forward. Always keeping in mind however difficult, perhaps even impossible, this charge might be. So with those brief remarks, I wanna just briefly introduce our speakers to you. Um, you have a lot more information on their accomplishments in the invitation to the event. Our first speaker obviously will be Dr. Eugene Richardson, who received his uh, Bachelor's of Science, his BS in Biology from Duke. So this is almost an all Duke panel. He received his MD from Cornell Medical College and then uh, soon after that, a PhD in Anthropology from Stanford. He previously served as the clinical lead for Partners in Health Ebola Response in Kono District in Sierra Leone. And he continues to conduct collaborative research on the social epidemiology of Ebola with his colleagues there. More recently, he was seconded to the Africa CDC to join their COVID-19 response, and currently he's chair of the Lancet Commission on Reparations and Redistributive Justice. That's just a brief introduction. There's so much more to say about him, um, but in the interest of time, I'll just quickly introduce our other panelists. Our first panelist will be Dr. Paul Farmer, also an undergrad from Duke, who is the Colo Cotrones University Professor and Chair of the Department of Global Health and social medicine at Harvard Medical School, and of course, the co-founder and chief strategist of Partners in Health. Our next panelist will be Dr. Agnes Vinyawahu, a physician and a pediatrician uh, in Rwanda. She's been providing clinical care in the public sector since the early 2000s and at very high level government positions, first as the exec executive secretary of Rwanda's National AIDS Control Commission, and then as the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Health, and then five years as the Minister of Health of Rwanda. Um, with Paul Farmer, she co-founded the University of Global Health Equity, and, which is an initiative of Partners in Health, and she currently serves as the Vice Chancellor of the University of Global Health Equity, and is also on the faculty at Harvard. And finally, we're delighted to welcome Professor William Sandy Darity, who is the Samuel Dubois Cook Professor of Public Policy African and African American Studies and Economics, and is the director of the Samuel Dubois Cook Center on Social Equity at Duke University. He has a very recent book out, co-authored with um, A. Kirsten Mullen, titled From Here to Equality, Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st Century. So let me hand over to Jean now. Okay, thanks so much, Dr. Stewart, for organizing this event. Um, and to the panelists, panel of my heroes. 
So I'm really looking forward to uh, joining you guys today. Uh, I'm going to share some slides. And I'll talk briefly about the book and then uh, we'll hear from the panelists and then uh, have some time for discussion and Q&A. So the book is called uh, Epidemic Illusions on the Coloniality of Global Public Health. And this little GIF here basically sums it up, um, you know, whereas uh, universities position themselves as the standard bearers of truth and for Harvard, the the logo normally says uh, veritas or truth. Uh, the book probes how institutions uh, like universities um, act more as uh, uh, monopolists on, uh, on this type of capital. Um, and so the book comes from a pragmatist notion of truth where um, you know, the, the truth of social phenomena is not a capital T truth, but it's actually a curated interpretation that people come to agree upon. Um, and the way we advance through different vocabularies is that um, you know, hopefully we have justice behind them um, or we have uh, you know, elite interests behind them. But there can always be an ideology found between, behind how we uh, describe social phenomena. And in the book, I delve into what those ideologies might be in the form of uh, global, global public health science and epidemiology. So here's a cover of the book. Um, and the cover design is based on uh, Plato's cave. The, uh, the dialogue with uh, Socrates and Glaucon um, that I first read as a Duke undergrad over on East Campus. I remember the philosophy class was there. Um, I don't know if his philosophy is still there. But um, this also kind of sums up the, the book in that uh, Plato's Cave posits a world where uh, you know, people are chained metaphorically uh, and can only see these shadows on the wall and that becomes their reality. Here's a coronavirus here. But that one amongst their midst, usually a philosopher or social scientist can go out into the real world and see what things look like in the sun and then come back and say, this is what capital T truth looks like. Um, the book takes a different ep epistemological stance in that there are many ways, there are pluriversal ways of describing social phenomena and health phenomena. But the one that usually comes to the fore is, is a way that describes uh, elite, or a way that um, benefits elites. And that if we were to create a situation where uh, people's ideas and, and ways of seeing the world all had equal prominence, then we might have something more like a, a Warren, where we were able, where we would free to move between places to find different vocabularies to describe the phenomena around us. Um, and the goal of the book is to try to find more just ways of describing social ph phenomena, because the ways we currently use, I argue, support neoliberal, neoliberal and um, economic interests, uh, elite interests. So as far as my position, um, you know, my, my aim as a, an anthropologist is not to represent the majority world's experience of uh, epistemic violence, but it's rather through the participant observation in halls of power from the UN to WHO, to elite universities, to NGOs uh, acting in the humanitarian space to uh, engage with it uh, and say, um, to, to essentially report on how the harmers can do their harm. Um, as far as the, the moral debates that are going on, um, you know, descendants of colonialists are not morally related to those they've exploited and oppressed as potential helpers or survivors or, or saviors. That's the current uh, humanitarian aid model, and I would argue the, the uh, public health science model, where those in the global north have resources from whether it's money or uh, medical devices or methodologies to come to the global south uh, as potential helpers. What I think most of uh, the social scientists don't recognize is that uh, we are actually morally related to people in the global south as supporters of and beneficiaries from a global institutional order that systematizes this oppression. 
And because the most of the what we call global public health science does not expose this, um, it actually creates a, a situation where uh, the, the, the perception of people is colonized to the tune that this is not evident. Um, and, but when it does become evident, then in, the interventions change from potentially uh, aid paradigms to those more uh, concerning reparations, which we'll get to. So I just wanted to go through a, a couple definitions and social theoretical bits that are useful for um, if, if you're interested in reading the book. So coloniality, which is a theory developed by uh, scholars in the global south, inc including the sociologist uh, Anibal uh, Kikano from Peru, uh, can be described as the matrix of power relations that persistently manifest despite a former colony's achievement of nationhood. The framework attempts to capture the racial, political, economic, social, epistemological, linguistic, and gendered hierarchical orders imposed by European colonialism that transcended uh, decolonization and continue to oppress in accordance with the needs of capital accumulation. Uh, Ramon Grossfugel says that the heterogeneous and multiple global structures put into place over 450 years did not evaporate with the juridical political decolonization or independence of the uh, periphery over the past 50 years. We continue to live under the same colonial power matrix. So we move from independence, political independence, um, that is a period of global colonialism to the current period of global coloniality. And Sabelo and Glovo says, despite the celebration of decolonization as a milestone in the African history of liberation, Africa has not managed to free itself from epistemological colonization inscribed on the continent and its people by mission and secular schools, religious domination, uh, schools of medicine, schools of public health, and other institutions that carry Western cultural imperialism. And that is a main argument of the book that um, although it may seem a uh, objective neutral science that public health and epidemiology is actually a, a uh, an institution that carries Western cultural imperialism. And, and I'm interested in um, how perception is colonized. So colonialism imposed its control of the social production of wealth through military conquest and subsequent political dictatorship. But its most important area of domination was the mental universe of the colonies, the control through culture of how people perceive themselves and their relationship to the world. And this is the key point. I think what we, what our uni, what our university is under the banner of Veritas put out there as a capital T truth, really is a way of imposing perceptions of social phenomena onto people that may have very different views and view uh, views that um, lead to uh, very different interventions if we were to follow them. Uh, cultural hegemony is another uh, term. So if exploitive socioeconomic relations are indeed foundational to the social order, as they are in the US and as they are in uh, global south, global north relations, then it is likely to have a fundamental shaping effect on social ideation. And so I would argue that in any social science from economics to sociology to anthropology to epidemiology, you can find ideology um, and one that is often um, dealing in exploitative socioeconomic relations built in, baked into it. Uh, I call the type of uh, science being done bourgeois empiricism. And uh, Richard Levins and Richard Le Lewontin had to say that, uh, uh, this is a paraphrase, models of disease causation that obscure socio-historical forces are themselves political acts giving support to social structures that hide behind scientific objectivity to perpetuate dependency, exploitation, racism, elitism, and colonialism. And I'll give an example of how um, uh, models of disease causation, uh, what would seem like uh, benign COVID models can actually do racist work. Uh, one other term, symbolic violence. Uh, can be thought of as the capacity to impose the means for comprehending and adapting to the social world by representing the economic and political world in disguised and taken for granted forms. Uh, and some of the book comes from my experience uh, studying Buddhist philosophy, um, in particular the Huayan tradition, which is 
kind of the philosophical form of Buddhism in uh, around 6th, 7th century China that led to uh, Zen, Chan then Zen. Um, and it, it, uh, it promotes and it tries to promote an understanding of radical relationality. So not individuals as the prime movers of, you know, uh, or the prime nodes to examine when you're looking at social phenomena, but rather looking at the relations um, and how uh, different social forces and historical forces are transmitted amongst individual nodes. The book also uses uh, kind of the detournement um, from the uh, was it 50s and 60s, where I take, um, you know, known uh, articles or philosophical treatises or even posters and change them in ways that allow, to you, allow you to use the tools that were in the original poster, but to rattle them around to understand things in a different way. So this poster right here was the one you would see when you landed in Sierra Leone. And it basically says, you know, go to the health center if you have any of these uh, symptoms, really presupposing that Ebola is a cause of this type of suffering. You know, but what is the cause of the cause? Why was it that there was, uh, you know, such a rampant Ebola outbreak uh, in West Africa from uh, 2013 to 16? And uh, Paul will talk about a bit about that in his panel um, and in a, a new book that he's written on the topic. But in just changing this around uh, to, to show what could are the different potential causes of having an underdeveloped health center, which allows Ebola to propagate, um, you know, flips this on its head. And so we see illicit financial flows and epistemic violence and structural adjustment and the Holocaust of slavery and barbaric colonialism and purposeful underdevelopment, all as determinants of uh, the big outbreak, but determinants that you rarely find in any analysis or any uh, infectious disease modeling of uh, the epidemic. So using the instruments of epidemiology, um, you know, the role, this is uh, an interview between uh, Foucault and Deleuze and uh, Foucault says, the role of the intellectual is no longer to situate himself slightly ahead or slightly to one side in order to speak the silent truth of each and all. You know, it's no longer to get outside of the cave and go up and come back and tell people what capital T truth is. It's rather to struggle against those forms of power where he, she is both object and an instrument. So, and I think that is what um, is hardly done at all, you know how are the forms of uh, the ways we describe health phenomena as, as a discipline of epidemiology? How is that an instrument of power? Um, I continue to argue that uh, mathematical models of infectious disease are uh, merely fables then uh, dressed in formal language that therefore create the illusion of being scientific. For the most part, these models serve not as forecast, but the, rather, rather as the means for setting epistemic confines to the understanding of why some groups live sicker lives than others. And these are confines that sustain predatory accumulation rather than challenge it. Uh, and here's an article in BMJ Global Health, which is pretty much serves as the afterword in the book. Um, so give a, a quick example of how um, Ebola models might commit symbolic violence. So here is one from some Princeton researchers, spatial and temporal dynamics of super spreading events in 2014. Ebola epidemic. And once they published it, the, the news got a hold of the article or, and basically talked to the researchers. And this is what they concluded, that super spreaders drove the Ebola output, the study found. So basically saying that someone like this who transmits to maybe five or six people, they have driven the outbreak. They are responsible. They are causal in an outbreak that had a minimum of 20, 28,000 cases across the, uh, the region. And my point would, is that if we just examine the categories we use, we can see a lot of ideological being work be being done. So is this a super spreader? Uh, is he an Ebola patient? Um, is he a PPF bereft care nexus? So uh, uh, um, personal protective equipment bereft care nexus. That would, that would be the relational view, that this is not a, a rational actor with agency that has chosen to spread to six different people and um, therefore receive some sort of responsibility or has some sort of agency in it. Um, you know, 
that they're really just a node in an underdeveloped health system that has propagated uh, a virus because of distal determinants. And, and these distal determinants are things like uh, structural adjustment and uh, legacies of colonialism and things that uh, Paul discusses so well in the, in the book he's going to talk a bit about. So uh, to me, this is, a, this is symbolic violence uh, in a nutshell. Uh, using a category that you've developed, super spreader, as some kind of objective term in the science of epidemiology, but then employing it in a way that really only allows us to, okay, well, what's the intervention? We have to find these super spreaders and isolate them quickly. That's it. When you start looking at mining companies that have uh, been thieving in the region for decades and not paying their taxes, such that there's no health infrastructure in place to contain the outbreak. And we've shown in another paper that uh, the money on taxes from diamonds alone could have created a health infrastructure in Sierra Leone that would have contained the outbreak. And it's easy to see these mining companies as the super spreader, as the entity that has set the conditions which allow the virus to propagate. But no one's calling the mining company a, a super spreader. Um, and since they're not, they're not on, on now not allowing us to intervene in a public health sense at that level. If they did, then the intervention would become not so much isolation tanks, but reparations. Uh, how do we repair these legacies of colonialism and structural adjustment that have led to this situation such so that it would not happen again? Um, and Dr. Darity will talk about his uh, work on reparations in the US in a little bit. Uh, so the book further goes a little further talking about epidemiology as dispositif, um, which is just means apparatus in French. Um, I prefer uh, Agamben's extension of Foucault's definition. He says, further expanding the, lar the already large class of Foucauldian apparatuses, I shall call an apparatus literally anything that has in some way the capacity to capture, orient, determine, intercept, model, control, or secure the gestures behaviors and opinions or discourses of living beings. So it's pretty easy to see how infectious disease models and forecasts do that. They sort of capture uh, uh, our attention. They orient us towards behaviors like wearing masks and social distancing. They help determine those behaviors. They secure the gestures and they set limits on what those interventions can be. You will never see uh, a, um, a paper that talks about reparations as an intervention uh, on um, potentially reducing COVID uh, transmission until me and Paul and uh, Dr. Darity put one out, which I'll show you the preprint in a second. So in the book, I go through critiques of causal inference. Uh, this article right here does a great job of it, so I won't talk about it today, um, but I highly recommend it. Uh, big data, regression models, and especially epidemic modeling. And that's what I'll talk about in the last five minutes. Um, and so uh, the focus here will be on the uh, Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, which has received over $600 million from the Gates Foundation to give us some uh, pretty poor COVID models and also um, global burden of disease studies. Just picking on the IHME COVID forecasts, early on um, their prediction of next day deaths was outside uh, their 95% confidence intervals 70% of the time. So they're <laughs> hugely wrong. But the low numbers that they showed also um, gave, uh, they, they, uh, they endorsed Trump's respondents as competent and effective. So they are used for ideological terms and that's, it means, and that's my point. You know, you can find models that pretty much say anything. And so you just pick which one would set, which says you, your previously held ideology. But also um, uh, they were racist. And you know, here's a good article from Nassim Talib on uh, why models are probably useless in the first place because it's hard, it's, you know, it's impossible to predict a single point forecast when you, when you have these fat tailed variables. And so you're better off in the beginning not wasting resources on forecasting but taking the most paranoid route possible like Wuhan did, like uh, uh, Tokyo did, like uh, Seoul did and they were able to contain quickly. Compare that to what Italy did, and you can easily see what you need to do to contain an outbreak. You don't need these forecasts. And the reason I think the forecasts are racist is because 
they endorse a future where COVID-19 disparities continue to exist. So even if they say, uh, wear your mask, social distance, they'll reduce the number of infections, but we're still gonna have disparities in those numbers of infections. And so they, they forecast a future where institutionalized racism is rampant, hyper-incarceration is ongoing, universal health co coverage is denied. And in short, they actively delimit through their exaggerated precision and acceptance of government interventions as status quo, saying that they're basically outbreak science, when really they're just a way of uh, giving us a social imaginary, but a social imaginary that lacks racial justice. Um, and so they delimit the public's ability to imagine social alternatives. In an effort to imagine social alternatives, we created uh, the Lancet Commission on Reparations and Redistributive Justice, um, Dr. Darity and Farmer are on. Um, and in an effort to do some anti-racist modeling, we put out this paper, Reparation for Black American Descendants of Persons Enslaved in the US and their estimated impact on SARS-CoV-2 transmission. Um, if you're interested in it, you can find the preprint here. It's been accepted at Social Science and Medicine and will be out in a month or two. But uh, in conclusion, essentially the book is, tries to trace the human rights failings of, of the impoverished uh, discursive infrastructure of objectivist epidemiology. And by doing that, we can transform global health by transforming its uh, <laughs> representations. But that is a segue to rep uh, reparations. So that, uh, you know, I work in the realm of symbolic reparations, but uh, notably uh, more important are um, movements for um, material reparations. And so I'd like to request first that um, Prof Professor Darity join us uh, to discuss his work over the past several decades um, on uh, reparations for Black Americans um, in the 21st century. Uh, and here, as um, Dr. Stewart mentioned earlier, we have his uh, brilliant book, which I recommend everybody read. And I, I know it's uh, doing well, um, that he co-authored with Kirsten Mullen. Um, and uh, I'll leave it there. Uh, Dr. Darity, would you please enlighten us? Oh, Dr. Darity. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> really, really uh, incredibly generous of you to mention our book during uh, discussion of your book. And I'd like to make a couple of comments about your book before I, I go further. Uh, the first thing is that it was it was somewhat challenging to read, in part because the structure is not linear. And uh, I think that's intentionally so. I think that you you've used the book structure to uh, to create a, a, a subversive statement, uh, and uh, and it's 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 very creative, uh, but but I must say it was it was a challenge to try to wind my way through it. Uh, it was helpful for me today to actually hear you uh, speak to our class in the morning, uh, which was also a very generous uh, contribution of your time. Uh, but I will say that uh, there, there's one story that you tell in the book that I think you've told in other, other places about the HIV experiment that was conducted uh, in rural Uganda, where uh, uh, folks were, uh, were allowed to remain uh, untreated in any way and to, uh, to transmit the disease. Uh, without them knowing themselves that they were that they were doing that, and it reminded me obviously of the Tuskegee experiment in the United States, uh, where uh, individuals who had contracted syphilis were not given any kind of treatment for it, despite the existence of appropriate medications, uh, because the uh, the research team just wanted to see how the disease would evolve. Uh, and I think that this is representative of the types of atrocities that have to be met with some form of reparative justice. And so in, in our book, we identify three phases of American history that are pertinent to a case for reparations for Black American descendants of US slavery. The first is, um, is, is slavery itself. The second is uh, nearly 100 years of legal segregation in the United States, inclusive of a wave of massacres 
uh, north and south, east and west, about a hundred of them that took place between the end of the Civil War and the uh, and the and 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 the uh, start of World War II, and these resulted in uh, substantial loss of Black lives, but also uh, the destruction or appropriation of Black property by the white mobsters. And then the third phase is the uh, is the is the period after the civil rights legislation, where we have ongoing mass incarceration ongoing police executions of unarmed Blacks, ongoing discrimination in labor, employment, and credit markets. And then perhaps most significant is the fact, from my standpoint, that uh, the Black-white wealth differential in the United States amounts to approximately $850,000 per household. And in our book, that's the statistic that sets the basis for trying to establish what the minimum would be for a reparations bill. Uh, so in each case where one identifies a history of atrocities, one also has to identify a standard for compensation. And the standard that we use in the context of the United States is his, the United States' history is the, uh, is the black-white difference in wealth. Uh, so uh, that's, that's kind of a, a, a five-minute summary of the book, uh, but, uh, but I think that there's a very sharp connection between the question of the types of atrocities that you have explored in uh, epidemic illusions uh, that justify reparations, as well as uh, as the case the case that we've worked on in from here to equality. Thanks so much. Uh, I really appreciate it. And yes, the the connections uh, are um, they're they're fluid, um, and that's. Hopefully our Lancet Commission will, will make that clear and, and put the conversation uh, on uh, a higher stage. Um, let's see, next. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Farmer to speak. Uh, interestingly, um, Dr. Derry, the, the, that example you brought up of the, um, of the, horribly unethical study in Uganda. I learned from a, a chapter Paul the Farmer had written previously. He does a very good job of, uh, early on of, of exploring and calling that out early because that, that trial was actually well accepted by the scientific community as giving us the answer to what viral load, uh, how, how differences in viral load mean how transmissible you are when you're infected. I think Paul was one of the first to really call it out and critically engage with it. So I don't know if you want to comment on that, Paul, or go straight to sure. um, um, Also just wanted to throw out there your new book, um, which um, uh, talks about a lot of the work we did together in West Africa. It's called Fever, Fuse, and Diamonds. Um, and you're one that really taught me about this uh, containment over care paradigm, which uh, has existed for decades uh, in, in West Africa and, and helped me understand that a lot better. So if you wouldn't mind teaching us a bit about it, I would be most with, grateful. With pleasure. And I just want to echo uh, Sandy's point and Kearsley's too, that this is a uh, remarkable um, achievement and one that's sure to niggle and nag at people for a long time. I mean, it is meant, as, as Sandy said, the structure of it is meant to turn things upside down and shake us up epistemologically, and it does so very admirably. I have a feeling that this is the kind of book we're going to be able to go back to and read again and again. And, and so I just want to say, Gene, con congratulations on, on getting it done. I will pick up on just what you said, because I think um, it, it's really the, the sweet spot for, um, in a way, for medical anthropology as well, um, and that is you brought up uh, the example, or Sandy did, of the Uganda study. And I think, uh, as you point out, um, and as historians remind us, it's better for us to understand not always the motivations of the people who are doing the research in the case of the Uganda, because I uh, do not question their motivations darkly, uh, in much less than you do in your book. I'm not talking about the specific researchers, um, but uh, in general, like for example, the colonial pastorians who are the direct uh, heirs of pastor 
and, and others of the late 19th century sanitary revolution, you know, we don't have a, a good brain biopsy or a soul biopsy or whatever it may be called. So we, you know, I, I tried to steer away from a study of Pasteurian motivations and focus on Pasteurian actions and inactions. Just as, you know, when we look at symbolic violence, we would, you would never forget violence that is done with Gatling guns and advanced artillery that, the, that were not present uh, at the end of the 19th century, unless they were imported by the French, British, or Germans, who used these very real material, non-symbolic tools to crush the opposition. And, you know, again, for many historians uh, of the region, well, I'm going to stick with West Africa a little bit, they already knew all this, but we didn't, and you may have too, but when we got there to take care of Ebola patients, I know for sure I did not. I went straight from Rwanda, and that's where, as an aside, that's where I met Jean uh, in the middle of an, uh, the, the crisis there. And again, there were acts of symbolic violence, cultural hege hegemony, et cetera, but there were lots of actions. Uh, there, were a lot, there was lots of other violent acts as well that would never be parsed under the title symbolic. Let me go back though, to the way this works itself out in public health as it stands now. Of course, this is the rich vein of critique that you offer in your book. Just as I would not uh, make too many uh, speculations about the motivations of the colonial pastorians, I'm not interested in making speculations about IHME's motivations either. Uh, and again, this is a, um, you know, not a trivial kind of dismissal, uh, but it's one that I, I think that focusing on structural violence can also be a way, a corrective um, uh, that we've seen when we focus on any kind of symbolic violence and forget about the Gatling gun kind of violence. Let me go back to uh, the introduction that uh, Kirsa gave Agnes. She points out that she was head of the National AIDS Control Commission. So when I talk about control over care, I'm also talking about its current manifestations in, for example, AIDS control programs that don't introduce care uh, for AIDS or cancer control programs that don't introduce treatment for childhood leukemia, even we, though, when we don't know how to control childhood leukemia or breast cancer, right? And I could go right on through the list and it's not just complex therapies like AIDS and cancer care. Ask Dr. Agnes about her experience trying to get HPV vaccine. Right? If we're going to talk about neoliberalism, we want to talk about markets, we want to talk about costs, we want to talk about what is it exactly that makes these Pasteurian motivations so hangdog and low for poor people who happen to be people of color, right? So why is it that it was okay for years to say, hey, you know, we can have an AIDS control program, but we can't have AIDS treatment in it. And if it weren't for Dr. Agnes, you know, who knows how long that kind of fiction would have played itself out in Rwanda and elsewhere in Africa. You, you needed people to say, well, you might not be able to assess my motivations, but I can show you how to assess my program for rollout of ARVs or HPV vaccine or cancer diagnosis and care. And so this is my call in, in laying out uh, a history of control over care. First of all, it's alive and well. We don't apply it to ourselves. Con clinical nihilism is reserved for poor people, right? They're the ones who don't need care, right? It's too expensive, it's not cost-effective, it's not sustainable, it's not feasible, it's not prudent. The long list of excuses uh, for why we don't even have to bother with care for people who've been shafted by colonial rule, that's what we have to get into as, as anthropologists, historians, sociologists, saying how could that happen? How could we be practitioners of public health or international health or global health or tropical medicine for that matter, and go to these places where people are dying uh, left and right of these utterly you know, treatable pathogens. And I'm talking about early in the 20th century before, before toxic antibiotics, there was still treatment for sleeping sickness, there was still sleep treatment for malaria. So the control over care model flourished in West Africa and other parts of Africa, even after the revolution in therapeutics and vaccines, right? And, and that's, that's the kind of thing that we want. How does racism get in the body? 
How does imperialism get in the body? Well, it gets in through material means. You know, it also gets in, as you point out, Gene, again and again, through cultural hegemony and symbolic violence. But there's a lot of real aggression, and it's withholding aggression in a, in addition to uh, attack aggression with again artillery and other tools that really were not available. Uh, arms that were not available widely in West Africa at the time when the Europeans showed up with their vaccines. Same time, same people, same uh, era. So uh, to, to go just back to, to COVID and to set the stage for um, Dr. Agnes, um, who I regard as the leading figure of global health equity of our times, not because she's so smart, she is, but because she actually linked all of those disease control efforts to caregiving efforts. So of course, AIDS control was linked to AIDS care. Malaria control was linked to malaria care. Cancer care was linked to cancer prevention. And we're lucky when we had pathologies like HP, you know, like cervical cancer where there was a vaccine, but most of the time we didn't. And um, this would be the greatest neoliberal trick ever if we allow our critique of the neocoloniality of global health to rob it of its promise of material repair. And, you know, again, in my book, and, you know, I, I talk about reparations, but uh, I also want to learn from people like Sandy when and how best to use that term, uh, uh, you know, and when to use others. Uh, but those other, others need to be tightly linked to the kind of things that we heard, Gene, when we were caring for patients with Ebola or anything else, day in and day out, they talked to us about material things, tin roofs, enough food to eat, and that's what's happening with COVID. 80% of the people who need accompaniment in order to be isolated after a COVID diagnosis, 80% in Massachusetts have food insecurity as their top concern. So, you know, again, Wherever we go, we find that social pathologies are linked to the spread of epidemic disease and many other diseases that aren't considered pandemic or epidemics. And I just wanna again say, Gene, that this book is sure to provide, it's sure to rankle people, I have no doubt, but you relish that role. It's also sure to provide for many, many years a chance for us to critically rethink our categories and to rethink how it is we link symbolic redress with material redress. Yes, thanks so much. I mean, that's why the, my heroes are on this panel because I think all of the, the, the interweaving and uh, you know uh, points of view that are necessary for for you know bringing uh, prag pragmatic solidarity to achieving global health equity um, can is is on display today. Um, and, and with that, I'd like to uh, introduce our final panelist. Um, although I will say, I remember one time Paul calling me when I was working in an Ebola tent and, uh, and saying, what are you doing today? And I was like, oh yeah, I'm working on that paper. He's like, no, 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 no. What are you doing for patients today? I said, oh, I got to go buy some shoes for this guy we're about to discharge. He's like, all right, that's the work I want to hear about. So I, I did learn early on the, the the material uh, is important, and um, and so, but the book does delve deeply into the symbolic parts. Um, so here's a, a picture of the beautiful uh, University of Global Health Equity, um, uh, of which um, uh, Dr. Benaguajo is the vice chancellor. And I just like to uh, ask her to uh, talk about some of the work she did in bring, bringing care to these control paradigms um, and to the role of UGHE as, a, uh, as an institute in the periphery of, of health equity. Um, and it has a very strong role in promoting women in the Global South too. So if you wouldn't mind teaching us, Dr. Agnes, I'd be much appreciative. Yeah, let's unmute myself. Hello, everybody again. So thank you, Jean, for uh, creating uh, this uh, great occasion uh, to um, 
through your book. I have enjoyed reading it. And that's true that I remember uh, when you send me the electronic version because your material version is not yet around, uh, that the first pages I was also a little bit um, uh, disturbed, but I have enjoyed it 100%. And uh, uh, so uh, I want to um, today to present to uh, this panel and the people who are uh, participating uh, and demo to present the UJG and to demonstrate how we are working to challenge uh, this problem that you evoke in the book. And uh, the same way, my teaching students, uh, it is the same fight. And I want to uh, echo my bro, Paul, that for me, you know, we need to revisit the dictionary. For me, control is prevention, care, and treatment, and control something that, according to the definition of WHO, the only thing I agree with WHO, and a little bit more, it is it, it, it's a state of wellness for health, mental health, and also social. It's in there. So control go with all of this and accept people who are maybe they have a mental health disease and we should treat them just see a portion of the signification of this word this word when we talk about uh, a human so i have enjoyed your book and let's go uh, uh, go ahead kedes go directly to slide three and uh, i want uh, to start here by talking about global health education. And you can see that according to a study at, uh, done uh, published in BMG, 88% uh, of global health masters are unaffordable for low and mid-income countries and are located in uh, rich countries. And I want also uh, to recall that this, art this article we have uh, published that a desk review, um, talk about fees and uh, talk about us also at UJG. And I want to uh, say here that at UJG, we doesn't have fees. And like an example, our medical students have all, have all have to go out with a master in global health service delivery because we know that's the only way for them to understand the world where they are going to navigate to build or repair or, or strengthen the health sector for them to be able to provide care to the vulnerable. So they study for zero fee and they go out with a dual degree of MD and um, a master in uh, uh, global health delivery, and they sign a commitment to work six to nine years for their full salary for vulnerable across the world. Of course, Rwanda will work in Rwanda, and after that, that's the only thing we ask them to turn the education we give. And Paul is my uh, dear chancellor. If I'm the vice chancellor and, and Jean is also uh, a teacher in uh, uh, our university, but what we want is to turn the education we give to them in really quality care delivery delivered to the vulnerable. So um, we build the University of Global Health Equity, uh, known as UJG, in a poor country. Mm -hmm. And, I, and in, in that poor country, which is my country, but where I have to say that the outcome of the treatment of HIV is better than uh, uh, the, the, in the US or in France, uh, we build that in a poor district, in a poor country where 10 years ago, people had to walk three days sometime to get care because there were no hospital. And now in this hill, in the middle of the north of our beloved Rwanda, you have one of the best hospital of the district hospital of Rwanda and one of the best global health education hub in the world. And um, next, you, you will see that uh, health and medical education often are disconnected from the reality on the ground. Uh, to challenge this, our students are living and work in 
remote rural area. That seems like all the remote area in the world. And our classroom is the entire district and entire health sector embedded in the community where we live. And our students learn firsthand from experienced clinicians from all over the world, implementers and policy makers to be able to understand those disparities and the real needs of the, pas the, uh, the patient they have by analyzing the social determinant of health the patient face using biosocial tools, including anthropology, history, sociology, and I can continue, and cultural sensitivity, learning the, uh, the land and being the listeners of the community they want to serve. Uh, giving all this, our students understand how to turn equity and access that are uh, in, into practical realities for the life of the vulnerable. In addition, we ensure that anyone, regardless uh, ability to pay, uh, are attending the education. And uh, next slide, you will see that uh, we uh, decolonize global health and medical education. Uh, it is the, uh, yes, it is the right slide. Through decolonizing the curricula and through uh, student training uh, to train, sorry, to recognize not only the true experts that are most of the case inside the communities they serve, but also humanitarian misconduct. There was a question in the, in the chat, how we went to man, uh, humanitarian. The, the, there are very few humanitarian, humanitarian uh, good conduct, you know, uh, just because the, the humanitarian entities that are there out pretending doing goods are just making a good living for themselves, the majority of them, and are just stool and channel to continue this neocolonialism, the imperi imperialism and that has started years ago. When I say years ago, it's centuries ago. So we train our students to, to be comfortable enough to question the truth that of the dominant culture of the world, especially the truth that should not exist in a world that is just. Uh, they are trained to question pseudoscience and the monopoly of truth that is in your book, Jane. And uh, those monopoly of truth that are tools to normalize ideological principle that ultimately justify inequities and social order. And by understanding th those structural violence locally, nationally, and, and globally, they are better equipped and skilled to help and identify the vulnerable and the vulnerability of uh, the marginalized to and they, they will be able to leave no one out. So we teach also the students to question conventional wisdom using worldwide example. And here you can see, I'm going to take an example of Africa because I'm, I'm in Africa, I'm in Rwanda. And uh, we, talk, we talk about the history of colonialism like you did in your book, because those are the true examples to explain why the, the health sectors are not solid enough to, uh, to uh, respond to, to some threat. And if the students in their, uh, when they will be graduated doesn't understand that, they will not take the right action. They will follow those who say, oh, it's a control program, just control, don't give care. No, control is holistic, it's everything. And it has to take care about the history of the place. If not, you don't know how, how to, to manage. And you can see, they say that we revisit what the notion of poverty. Africa is poor. How come? In 2015, 162 billion came in Africa. Yes, but 203 billion went out. That means Africa supported the wealth of the high income countries. And we demonstrate that impact of the result of past imperialism and colonialism and new and the new neocolonialism neo on the health of the people and how they put the blame on Africa because the 
the health system is weak, but they don't go to the real source of that. The, the way the wealth of Africa is stolen for, you, for the Western world still now, and how this money, as you say, could help build a health sector, but they just reinforce the wealth of the Western world, but not all the Western world, because they are also vulnerable in the Western world, in the Western world that are neglected. So uh, we system systematically decolonize uh, our student curriculum and beyond quality education, clinical education, we teach them also the biosocial science and how it's absolutely needed to do, diag to do biosocial diagnostic and also to, to care about the patient in a holistic manner. And we challenge our students to question their conscientious and unconscious perception. They may have because of the social norms where they have been educated. And this apply all over the world to low and, uh, to low and middle income countries and to high income countries. So let me give you two examples that will talk to you. And uh, this, is, uh, this is example coming from COVID to show how biosocial approach matters. First, it helped to understand why region like my region will be the last to receive COVID-19 vaccine. Huh? Whatever, they sign COVID, uh, COVAX and all those things, we are very far from the commitment they have taken. So this is the history of atrocity that was di discussed in the beginning of uh, this panel. When you see that uh, black, uh, black American are most susceptible to get COVID, not because they are immunodepressed, just because they live in place where it's more crowded, just because they have less occasion to go to school, just because they have less occasion to have uh, work where they can work from home. And also they have, because of the fact that to get a vaccine, you need to have a smartphone to uh, register to internet, to go with a car. Many of them are excluded to get vaccinated. So they are more often sick, they have less access to healthcare, and they have less access to vaccine. I'm calling that a continuous genocide. Hmm? Because some of your governor have decided last week to stop, to stop the mask protection order and social distancing. They know that the people who will die the most are the poor, the people uh, that in America we call of color, like if you were transparent, the white people. Huh? You have color too. We are all from color. But this is knowing that people with dark skin will die the most. They know it and they order it for me just because the vaccine is coming and they will be safe. It's an occasion to eliminate some of them. Secondly, uh, uh, yes, so, uh, this is what I want to share that your book is really welcome. What you say and what you analyze about the international organization and WHO and the, 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 the coloniality is absolutely true. That's what we to teach to our student. And we also want a uh, next one will be about gender equity. We are for gender equity, not equality. In the medical education, we take 70% of students who have to be women just because we graduate less medical students female in Africa. In other courses, it's 50-50. So uh, this is done by purpose. It's not equity. It's a little contribution to reparation of the gender inequity balance that the continent have suffered, but the world should do the same. So thank you. There is a lot to say, but I think um, time is going. And of course, 
I have imperialistic vision to invade the world. Look at my lions. They are everywhere where partner in health is. And I want to bring those words everywhere and to beat the colonialists with the, we should also use their own arm and be smart enough. Thanks so much, Dr. Agnes. Uh, unfortunately for me, I'm gonna to have to retire now since you say everything so much better than me. Uh, what did um, I say? No, I didn't say I'm that. I'm not a job. No, no, I <laughs> say we have the same fight, guy. You do that uh, with your book and your clinical and I doing that with my teaching. You come and help me to do that with teaching. And you help me to, to, to spread the word and to spread the mindset and the education and help young people to be the next poll farmer and the next, uh, and to succeed where we didn't finish enough. <laughs> Thanks again. So you know, if you retire, I will, I will, I will, I will. Uh, don't care to be vaccinated. I will come and you will see me to put you at work, guy. There is a lot to do. No retiring for you. No. <laughs> Amen. All right. Uh, well, well, thanks again to uh, our panelists. And um, so for the last, looks like we have about ten minutes, but maybe people can stay. Um, Dr. Stewart, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, moderating some uh, Q&A for our panelists, please. Sure, I, I, I'm ready. I am armed and ready to go. Thank you, Dr. And yes, that was really inspiring. And everyone on the panel. Um, and you've managed to put smiles on everyone's faces, even at one hour and 10 minutes we're clocking in. So thank you. <laughs> I look forward to meeting you, actually. I hope to be in Rwanda next year. So with uh, Liz and Lizzie, we have um, kind of collated the questions that have come in, C continue to do so. We have, like uh, Jean said, about 10 minutes, three types of questions, sort of at the macro level, how do we engage and change global health systems and governance and funding? So uh, several questions came in around that. Then at more of a national level, uh, folks coming in with very, uh, very inspired by what Rwanda is doing, similar to what Cuba is doing, forging ahead with their own vision. And then a lot of questions for an individual level, um, mostly for Jean, how did you, how did you embark on your, uh, your moral path? How, what kind of advice do you have for young trainees? So those are the three types of questions we're getting. Let's start with the macro global systems level. Um, ben Meyer, who's an associate professor of global health policy, our neighbor at UNC in a fantastic uh, global health program over there too. Um, he asks, um, in considering distal determinants, how can global governance structures, UN, WHO, et cetera, be restructured to reshape power relations and decolonize global health? Other attendees, similar questions. How do we change the global health funding system? How do we make change when we see rich countries in a deep moral failure with their me first for COVID vaccine, et cetera? So panelists, I think people are anxious to hear about what your advice is at that global governance level for change. Paul and Agnes both have UN positions. So maybe you could start by telling us your ideas on reform and the uh, uh, and what can well, be done you know, in the philanthropic world. That, that's just sympathy. Those are just sympathy positions. We don't have positions. <laughs> um, meaning, like if, when we talk about the World Health Organization and funding, that, <clears throat> that's dumb because it's their funding that is the problem. They don't have enough funding. So, you know, I, I didn't know this when I went into the, this field. And I, when, when Dr. Agnes was a clinical pediatrician, you know, it's not like if you're a clinician, you just don't bump into these things. Like I, now we know there's no money in the WHO. That's not where we should be looking for money to repair the medical problems we're describing. So, you know, and, and to the point of the distal, if I could just say one thing, I think if distal means like downstream clinical problems facing people on an everyday basis, I think that's the biggest challenge we have in, uh, in what's called global health today is too little interest in actually attending to the ailments of the people that we're, I mean, like if you say, well, we're not, 
there to help them. It would be better if we were there to help them rather than to pretend that their medical problems don't exist. So it's, it's, it's even further down the, you know, the human descent tree to, uh, to uh, white, white saviors would be better than malevolent people who are setting up pro, they're not, sorry, I shouldn't say malevolent people. I don't know their motivations, but the, that the bigger problem is the experts who really just don't think we should be investing uh, in policies that provide that safety net. And I know you know you know more about the policy angle, but I'm sure you've seen it in your in your scholarly work and and what you hear and uh, in in teaching at UNC and elsewhere is sometimes we just like forget the whole distal part of it. Uh, and and one this is one of the worries I have about the interest in uh, you know social determinants. It sounds great, and we spent decades trying to get people to pay attention to those. But when they do, we don't want them to turn away from things like, back to Sandy's point, oh, oh and you know, whatever the, dis, the upstream determinant of STDs might be among sharecroppers, let's make sure and not forget the distal intervention that's called aqueous penicillin for their neurosyphilis. And uh, you know, that's what I've seen again and again over the last 40 years you know, in international health on to global health is a lack of attention to those distal matters. Sorry, Jean. So what I would like to say for me, uh, first of all, um, education, education, education. Uh, you have to give the people the tools to analyze and understand who they are, how they function, what are their methodology, so that you can trap them. And it works. I have to tell you, when I was minister, I never went to any WHO uh, World Health Assembly, and I just read science and apply them. And after that, learning how to uh, do advocacy. Everybody has his own style. I have my style, but Paul will tell you that I always reach where I want to reach. Not with kindness, I don't care. But there are the people who are reaching far with more. So learn, teach people to advocate. Teach them why they should. Teach them how to do it. Teach, teach them how the world is broken and why. And they are always give a hand to those who move and who move fast. But we are progressing. Don't, don't believe we are not progressing. We are progressing. There is a lot to do. And uh, the greed of uh, the bad guys uh, will never decrease. You can just preempt it and uh, never forget the best arm still. And we have some uh, discussion there, but I love the legal framework because it allows me to legally stop you. Yeah. <laughs> when you are bad. So if I could do a segue here, talking about the importance of having le structures, legal structures in place, maybe Jean and Sandy could talk about legal structures and reparation. Is having some sort of legality, legal structures, the force of that important to moving forward with reparations? I know we've gotten, we've sort of, sometimes in human rights, we feel a little bit disappointed that those human rights structures don't really make it, they don't have any effect or force on the ground. What's, how does that play out in reparations? Structures and legal structures. Dr. Darity. So there's a distinction that I, 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 uh, I make with Kirsten Mullen in our book. And I think Jean actually mobilized this distinction this morning, uh, an analogy that was drawn by Malcolm X about a circumstance in which somebody plunges a knife into, into his back nine inches, and then they, uh, they pull it out six inches and, and claim that everything is resolved. And they pull it out all the way and claim that everything is resolved, uh, but the wound has not been healed. And I think that there's a distinction that should be made between policies that involve pulling the knife out and policies that heal the wound. So from my perspective, when we start talking about reparative justice, we are talking about the equivalent of healing the wound. 
but that doesn't mean that we, should, we don't need to have the knife pulled out. Uh, we have to have it pulled out all the way. And those are the, uh, the policies that are linked to uh, legal changes, uh, other types of structural changes in, in, uh, in an economic and social life that need to take place. And I think that that's really one of the, the central themes of, 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 Gene, of, of Gene's book, which is um, to say that uh, the actions that we take that are associated with conventional public health practice simply are not enough. And in some contexts may go against the goals that we, we truly value. Uh, that there has to be changes in the entire fabric of a social environment in societies to make it possible for those public health practices that we conventionally use to have the effects and impact that we would hope. Uh, and those changes are pulling the knife out. But on top of that, it's essential that we also heal the wound. Oh, well said. Thank you. <laughs> so we're at time, but I'm wondering if people can stick around a few more minutes. Several young uh, questions from junior scholars, people just starting their career, really anxious to hear from all of you advice on how what they should do now, um, even if they don't have access to the kind of courses that um, uh, Dr. Agnes mentioned. How do they start to craft a career where they can make a change in this space effectively um, and thinking that you know they're starting now how can they take the advantage of all the work that you guys have done and and change it in, and transform it into a career where they can be change makers you know just think about reading as a trip you can read and you discover new things new ideas and you cultivate what you know and harm yourself to understand better the world. Uh, read and never forget something. Everybody is the central of global health. The global health center is where each and every one of us have your two feet. So don't tell me that you need to take a plane, 100, 100 vaccine to go and work for global health. You can start with your neighbor. And if you cannot do that, don't come to my country pretending doing good. So read a lot and uh, practice where you are continuously. You know, that's very inspiring. And I, I just want to add to the students asking those questions that uh, we're all of us, including Kearsley, uh, we're friends with each other. Uh, and yes, Jean and Sandy and I are working together a lot on certain projects. Um, and this is all by way of answering your question, is one of the ways that we get involved in global health wherever we are, as, as Dr. Agnes said, wherever our two feet are planted, is by working together on, on projects. I mean, Jean and I work on clinical projects as well. Yesterday I was hassling them about some patients you know, and, and medications that they needed. Dr. Agnes and I work on clinical matters teaching, but even on planting things on, on the campus. Um, we're all learning from Sandy about uh, the legal framework for reparations and Kirsten as well. That book is, is awesome. The only thing that I would add in addition to work together, you know, one, Dr. Agnes said, global health is wherever you are. Two, you've got to find people that you care to work with. Uh, a third is the, the products that we're talking about, particularly the university and its courses, are, are not meant to be available only to, to those young women who are completing medical degrees in Rwanda, but to the world. And uh, when uh, I'm sure almost all of you, if not all of you got what Dr. Agnes was saying, she said she wants to be an imperialist and what she's, her empire is the health and global equity agenda of the university. And, and I think, you know, if the people listening could be involved in this university, we definitely want it to be a different kind of university, uh, an open university. Uh, 
and that can also do the heavy lifting of clinical teaching for nurses, doctors, and others, but it's for everybody. Absolutely. And we will have campus all over the world. And uh, there are uh, question here. I just except, see- Except Chapel Hill. We can't have a campus in Chapel Hill. I don't know why it is, you know. Um, Sometimes I'm uh, very happy to be literated in some corner. Chapel of Hill is the, UNC is the great rival of Duke, you see, my dear. Okay, okay. It's a, it's a sports thing you would not understand. Neither do I. <laughs> That's what I call jargon, you know, okay. Uh, <laughs> is there one oh, fi final yeah, set of I questions? I have one last set of questions, yeah. I, and I and I I'd love to hear you guys again speaking to the 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 young the students who are now formulating their strategies for their careers, and particularly for Dr. Agnes, um, the the models and the frameworks and the 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 modes of knowledge that come that uh, come out of an elite Western university like Duke and um, from these global health governance systems how do we how do young people particularly at the um, university of global health equity how do they develop a critical apparatus and a framework how do they critique that knowledge um, and how do we also use that critique here at, at a place like duke and elsewhere how do we join forces with that new vision with that new critique of this way of knowing the world and and to really bring these voices to the forefront um, and create these bridges between my students and your students i guess is the question okay so i'm going to repeat myself my dear uh how to create a bridge okay just first ask the list of uh, uh send an invite to your student and invite to our student and say who want to just know each other they are young people they will figure out it's okay mm -hmm. but also i want to say uh you you can come together and say we are going to go deep in in in, in a problem now and you can do that from here and from uh, and from where you are and uh, we have uh, uh, Gavin who, who have who say I see a question here about why does we uh, the Western world never talk about the success of Thailand, Mongolia, Korea? So once to, they can come together and have uh, some club of thought and thinking and go deep in uh, in the analysis using the principle show in the three books that we have talked here. So there is a lot to do. We doesn't have to be face to face. We are beautiful on a screen and it costs nothing, just the time of the people who want to come together. And, uh, and that's true. First of all, um, be modest. I love that uh, Gene in his books just say, I realized one day that I was a white privileged young guy. Uh, and coming to that, he starts thinking, where it come from? What can I do? And it's his way to repair, to, to, to contribute to such a book. There are so many things to do, uh, my dear Kese, that I don't understand that you don't find what to do. Just pass through Jean, Paul, me, ask list, and young people love to discuss and to talk to each other. When I met Paul, when I was still a little bit younger than I'm now. And we talked during hours, some night, we revised the world and now we apply it. And what I want to say, the objective is not to criticize for me. The objective is to build and bring health. I don't care to criticize if I can save one life. You see, my objective is to save life. And global health, I didn't know what it was in 2000, 2001, 2, 3, 4. However, I can realize that I have applied all the principle, what was based on equity. You, you, you understand? Thanks to friends in academia, we have together put theory around what we were doing. But it's not Western principle. It's not Western value. It is value of people who want to bring health and save life. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Agnes. I know we're over time now. And so I just want to thank everybody for joining us. 
And thanks to Dr. Stewart and Duke Global Health Institute for organizing it. Uh, thanks to our panelists. Thanks to Darian for the land acknowledgement. Uh, I saw there were a lot of questions. Sorry, we couldn't get everything. Uh, feel free to email me with any questions that were uh, direct for me. Um, and I, I'd love to connect. But again, uh, just a quick round of applause for our awesome panelists. And uh, I really appreciate everybody joining. Any, anybody, any last comments before we go? Uh, uh, to, we should do that more often. That means take time like this and dialogue, uh, try to go deep because we cannot go deep. But if we do that often, maybe we will advance in, in some field better. Yes. Well, maybe you know the vice chancellor of a university who could help set up some more of these events. Yeah, hmm. absolutely. And for the student, uh be curious D discover the world you don't need to travel for that you just need to have your heart in the right place and just say what can i do even if i'm st i'm stuck to my chair here you can change the world i i swear you i swear it because we we did it i feel better already just being with you all I do. Thank you. That's like it's a it's a joy for that reason. And so thank you all. Thank you, Duke. Okay. And 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 thank you, Jean, for for having written the book that made this occasion. Yes, absolutely. Congratulations, Jean. Yes. We'll see you all in Rwanda. It sounds like to me. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And student, start dialogue with your future friends here. Yeah. Bye bye. Merci. Bye, Merci Professor Agnes. <laughs> Thank you. Love to Kirsten. Bye.